So this is the second video of uh, building your narrative for investing. And uh, I talked about economic theories before, and now I wanna talk about uh, economics, the modern day influencers. In other words, people who show up on TV, you might hear about, I don't know them all, but I, I have come across a few of them. And I think they represent uh, three of the economic theories I talked about uh, in, in the economics theory uh, video. And uh, those three economic theories, I believe, uh, dominate uh, the conversation in the US today. Now, um, those three are uh, Keynesian, uh, the Chicago School of Economics, and now being called neoclassical uh, economics, and uh, Austrian, those are the three. And I, I wanna emphasize as I did in the first uh, video about uh, economic theories that no econ economist is purely one economic theory. I, I, when, when you have conversations with these people, um, they have a tendency to, uh, it's like a Venn diagram. You know, there's, they may be mostly Keynesian, a little bit of uh, neoclassical economics, some Austrian, uh, or you know, some variation of those. So uh, don't think in terms of economic theory as being a real pure type of field I, I yet to speak to or listen to in videos, any economist that uh, seems to be one thing. Some are closer than others, so I'll have to say that. So let's start with the, the Keynesians. And what I'm going to do is I'll go through each of these three. I'm going to play a short video clip, but at the end, uh, or not necessarily at the end, but below, you'll see links to the broader uh, conversation. And they're worthy of uh, listening to. I tried to pick clips that might interest people. Um, I don't. You know, I, I didn't uh, record them or uh, any of those things, but they are previous conversations that I've taken short clips from. So the uh, Keynesians, uh, remember the Keynesians uh, from uh, John Maynard Keynes uh, was in response to the Great Depression. They didn't really have the Keynesian or the uh, classical school of economics really didn't have an answer for um, the Great Depression. And this kind of opened up things for um, socialists and communists and things of that sort. Now, I consider Paul Krugman to kind of be one of the major influencers, and we'll be watching a clip here in a minute uh, with Paul Krugman in it. I think it kind of gives you a sense of Keynesian economics. Um, but it believes in government involvement. As a matter of fact, um, John Maynard Keynes uh, we'll probably would have, well, some of the things I read said that he thought he was a socialist, uh, would have identified as a socialist back then, but it's that you have government involvement in things. If the economy is in a Great Depression, you know, you got your FDRs coming out, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, come out with all these government programs to stimulate the economy. Um, they primarily believe in uh, creating demand, um, that uh, spending is greater than saving, um, that, uh, you know, they wanted to, actually in Keynes, uh, wanted to uh, have a balanced budget. And uh, one of the things that you find with the modern Keynesian is they don't worry too much about that. And some of that bleeds then over into uh, modern uh, monetary theory or MMT uh, and Stephanie Kelton, but I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, I'm trying to keep this rather general. Because um, they, you're supposed to, in good times, um, pay off some of the debt that you accumulate in, in bad times. So you spend, spend uh, during bad times, but modern day Keynesians completely <laughs> completely away from that. So uh, listen to the clip. I think this uh, pretty well closely identifies. It's with Paul Krugman. Um, and uh, I think it, it represents 
uh, the thinking of Keynesians uh, today. What's wrong, uh, Professor Krugman, right. with leaving the government out of the equation? Well, there are certain things. You know, you, you can't leave the government out of monetary policy. If you try to think, you know, we're, we're going to just let it set itself, it doesn't happen. The government is actually always, uh, the, the Federal Reserve, the central bank, is always going to be in the business of managing uh, monetary policy. If you think that, that you can avoid that, um, you're, living in some, you're living in the world as it was 150 years ago, right? We have a, an economy in which money is not just green pieces of paper. With, uh, with faces of dead presidents on them. Money is, is, uh, is the result of the financial system. It includes a variety of assets. We're not even quite sure where the line between money and non-money is. It's kind of a, a continuum. And look, history tells us that in fact, an un, a completely unmanaged economy is subject to extreme volatility, subject to extreme downturns. I know there's this legend that people like, uh, probably you, Congressman, have that the Great Depression was somehow caused by the government, caused by the Federal Reserve, but it's not true. The reality is that was a market economy run amok, which happens, happened repeatedly over, our, over the past couple of centuries. You do need, you know, I, I'm actually, I'm a believer in the market economy. I'm a believer in capitalism. I want the market economy to be left as free as it can be, but there are limits. You do need the government to step in to stabilize. Depressions are a bad thing for capitalism, and it's the role of the government to make sure that they don't happen, or if they do happen, that they don't last too long. Okay, so now uh, the uh, second uh, economic theory, and, the, 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 and I'll get to the influencer in a minute, it was the Chicago School, uh, neoclassical, supply-side economics, to me kind of falls under that. Uh, umbrella of things, and I did take some liberties here, in my opinion, as far as what I thought the three uh, economic theories are. They're mine, not, I found a hundred different variations of what those uh, economic theories that dominate in the U.S. today. But uh, the, the, the neoclassical or Chicago school, they primarily believe that some government's okay. It's okay to have some government involved in things, but they're all about um, getting inst government institutions out of things. They want to reduce regulation. They want to privatize things. Um, they want tax cuts. Uh, they are focused, as the Keynesians were, focused on the demand side. The uh, Chicago School neoclassical are, are focused on the supply side. Now, one of the things about the Chicago School is they are all about the data and scientific method and empiricism in what they do. Um, and uh, the efficient market hypothesis was a child of, <laughs> of this thinking. Um, and uh, I'll be doing a video on that later um, because the efficient market uh, hypothesis has problems, but the whole stock market and everything, the technical analysis and, and a lot of the things that, that come with it with regards to stock analysis or technical analysis uh, uh, should be called into question. So let me play this clip then from uh, a short clip from um, Milton Friedman himself um, identifying as the Chicago School of Economics and then a, a clip of Art Laffer actually from a uh, debate he had with Robert Reich. Um, so. And thirdly, if I can remember it, isn't there some benefit to having the government steal our money, which is what they do effectively. They'll hold a gun to our head and say, pay us 40% of your income or go to jail. They take this money and they give it mostly to government employees. Well, the government employees spend it. The marginal propensity to consume is pretty high. So the people who were robbed have to do something creative to get the money back. And isn't this creative activity the real wealth of Well, I take the it that they would have to be still more creative if 98% were being spent by the government. <laughs> <laughs> no, the third part of your thing is just pure fallacy from beginning to end. <laughs> because if those people who are now government employees were employed in creative activity and productive activity, they would also be spending their money. And we'd have a greater total around. All you're doing, let's suppose for a moment, take the extreme case, that that 40% is being used 
just to have people uh, uh, sit around. The fact that they spend their money doesn't alter the situation. The only product there is is what the 60% produce. And that 60% is divided among the 100%. If those 40% are also producing goods, then there are more goods to go around among everybody. We then had the four stooges. Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, uh, which I consider to be the largest, bi uh, the largest assemblage of bipartisan ignorance probably ever put on planet Earth. If you look at that period, we had stagnation for 16 straight years. The stock market collapsed during that period. Tax revenues from the top 1% of income earners went down as a share of GDP. Then we had, oh, excuse me. Does anyone have any water? No, excuse me. Then we had Ronnie. Oh, excuse me, the, the skies opened, the sun shone forth on the planet, the grass turned green, the, the, the animals they multiplied, the children danced in the tree street. The, the, we caught the highest tax rates of everything we could find. Uh, we had Steiger Hansen in 78, then we cut the, I mean, under Reagan cut it from 70% to 28%. If you look at the whole period from 1978 all the way to uh, 2007, we cut the highest tax rate on earned income from 50% to 35%. Uh, we cut the highest tax rates on unearned income from 70% to 15%. We cut the capital gains tax rate. We cut all of these tax rates across the board. We had a boom, and it wasn't just uh, Ronald Reagan. Robert, uh, your president, by the way, cut the capital gains tax rate dramatically. Uh, he got rid of capital gains taxes on owner-occupied homes uh, for everyone. Uh, he also got rid of the tax on, on, on uh, retirees working, uh, which was this between, group between 65 and 72. Uh, he also put in welfare reform. He also cut government spending as a share of GDP by more than the next four best presidents combined. And he had the greatest Secretary of Labor of all time. <laughs> the, uh, but he was a big tax cutter. We had huge growth during that period. If you look at what happened to the tax revenues from the top income earners, you know, in 1980... Okay, so that c covers the Chicago School, neoclassical. Again, these videos are available in the link below, the, the, the broader piece. I just wanted people to give a flavor to kind of show what uh, some of these influencers are. Obviously, Milton Friedman is, is long gone. Art Laffer is on Fox quite a bit. Um, uh, and Paul Krugman and uh, with Keynesian economics writes for the New York Times. He has a column there. Um, so the third uh, economic theory and uh, involves, as I mentioned before in, in the previous video on economic theories, um, that the economy, they're focused on individual behavior, human behavior. Uh, things are too complicated to be controlled by government, that government should basically stay out of things. And um, they're focused on production, they're focused on uh, savings, they're uh, focused on supply, uh, and that demand without supply means little. So you can see where the Austrians and the Keynesians are gonna be at odds with each other. Uh, and whereas the Keynesians believe that, you know, you gotta you know, create that demand, uh, government, in the Austrian eyes, uh, can't make things affordable uh, by creating money, which creates inflation. Um, and that's kind of playing out now uh, that affordability comes from greater production uh, and over time decreasing costs. Um, they also believe in gold backed money, um, that private money should be stimulating things, not government money, in other words, savings as opposed to um, the government providing the th these things. Um, and that irrational human behavior makes imp you know, empirical decisions and scientific method and data uh, basically, uh, well, not completely worthless, but pretty close to that. And uh, that, you know, from a, a depression standpoint, you know, how do you get out of the, the Keynesians, obviously, as I mentioned, you know, FDR with all of the uh, socialist types programs. Uh, the Chicago School um, would want government regulation kind of backed out. Um, but the Austrians just believe that you should just leave it alone. In other words, don't get involved with it. Don't stimulate the money supply. 
Uh, and I think this, you know, talking about human behavior, I think this goes against human behavior. When things go wrong, people want to fix things, even if they don't know what they're doing or have the correct information to do it, and especially in government. Um, so then you have uh, uh, in a, I, I set out a, a clip. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm a fan of Peter Schiff. Um, you know, he's libertarian. I kind of consider myself that. And again, I'm kind of a hodgepodge of things, but, um, and Art Laffer, uh, in a conversation back at CNBC, uh, before the great financial crisis of 2008. And, uh, I think it just, it's the reason, well, it's the original reason why I started listening to Peter Schiff, um, because he did call that there would be a downturn. Now, what he didn't anticipate was all the uh, quantitative easing the Fed would throw on economy, which has led us to our problems that we have today, uh, planted the seeds for inflation and, and all those things uh, and making interest rates low. And uh, primarily what originally started as uh, more of what I would think would be free market types of things that Greenspan had. Um, the Fed chair at the time uh, just got out of control. But uh, again, probably another video uh, associated with that. So in this video clip, Michelle Caruso Cabrera from CNBC is moderating kind of a, a, an argument. I'm not going to play the, the full clip, but it'll give you a sense. If you want to listen to more again, uh, below you'll see the links for the rest of these conversations and they're very interesting now the ones i picked i think are are worthy of you spending your time uh listening to uh but here they are uh talking about this uh the funny just one other side note michelle caruso cabrera in 2020 uh, who was previously a republican <laughs> ran against uh alexandria ocasio cortez uh, in the Queens district uh, that she was. She got wiped out pretty well by AOC. It'd be hard for a Republican kind of to win in a Democratic primary. But uh, regardless, it's just one of those little side notes I thought I think is interesting. Um, commentary. Uh, okay, so here's that video. This evening, the stock market had a good day today. Oil prices pulled back sharply. But despite the Dow hitting a three-month high, more and more analysts are cautioning that a recession could be just around the corner. Joining us now to debate the issue, recession or not, we're going to be joined by Art Laffer. He's chief investment officer of Laffer Investments and former economic advisor to President Reagan. And Peter Schiff, he's president of Euro Pacific Capital. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Peter, I want to start with you. Although there are more and more people saying that the U.S. economy will be in a recession next year, it is still a minority position. Why do you think that a recession is coming? Just how bad is it going to be? I think it's going to be pretty bad. And whether it starts in 07 or 08, I think, is immaterial. And I also think it's going to last not just for quarters, but for years. See, the basic problem with the U.S. economy is we have too much uh, consumption and, and borrowing and not enough production and savings. And what's going to happen is the American consumer is basically going to stop consuming and start rebuilding his savings, especially when he sees his home equity evaporate. And when you have the economy 70% consumption, you can't address those imbalances without a recession. You know, rather than the recession being resisted, it should really be embraced because the disease is all this debt finance consumption. Huh. The cure is that we stop consuming and start saving and producing again, and that's a recession. And sometimes, you know, medicine tastes bad, but you've got to swallow it. Art Laffer, you hear him? He says the consumer's going to slow down in order to rebuild the savings. And you know that two-thirds of the American economy is driven by the consumer. Do you believe that? No, I don't believe any of it whatsoever, Michelle. Excuse me. But, you know, what he's saying is that savings is way down in this country, but wealth has risen dramatically. The United States economy has never been better shape. There is no tax increase coming in the next couple of years. Monetary policy is spectacular. We have freer trade than ever before. And not only that, but there are no incomes policies things here. I, I think Peter is just totally off base, and I don't think it's going to be... I mean, I just don't know where he's getting his stuff. The well, one of us is, one of us is off base, but it's, it's definitely not me. I mean, it's not wealth that's increased in the last few years. We haven't increased our productive capacity. All that's increased is the paper values of our stocks and real estate. But that's not real wealth, no more than the NASDAQ was wealth. When, when you see the stock market come down and the real estate bubble burst, 
all that phony wealth is going to evaporate. And all well, that's going to be left is all the debt that we accumulated to foreigners. Peter, uh, I'm going to take a that. bet with you on this one. I'll, I'll bet you a penny on this one that if you'll sign a letter saying that if you're wrong, you'll, you'll sign a letter that you were wrong to me in this. But you're just way off base. There is nothing out there that tells us we're going to have a nice slowdown, but it's not going to be a All right, crash. let me ask you this. Now, you can see from this video that um, Peter Schiff, there, there's a assortment of videos out there. I'll try and put the links to some of the other ones that go through where people are basically laughing at Peter Schiff saying, you're, you know, you're out of your mind to think that and this would be in 2006, that there's going to be a housing crash and all these bad things were going to happen. So uh, Peter Schiff pretty well on record as being one of the people that did call the GFC. Um, and he's been calling for a collapse pretty much ever since then. But the uh, economy has been propped up by uh, easy money from the Fed, increasing the money supply and some of the Keynesian things that, that have been going on since then. So uh, my commentary is that uh, the Keynesians are all about what you're hearing today. They're socialists, in my mind. Um, they want the free stuff. Um, they're the uh, AOCs, really, of the world that are calling for more social, socialism in our economy. And to me, that has contributed to the problems that we're having today, um, creating more demand. Uh, and spending more money is not the answer to our economic ills, I believe, but I'm open to other uh, view, viewpoints. Um, the Chicago School, neoclassical, they're all about stimulating the supply. If, if Going back to the Art Laffer video that, that I played earlier um, in this episode. And then the Austrians are kind of like, keep the government out of everything. If if they would have stayed out, their belief is that they would have, the government would have stayed out of the Great Depression. Um, things would have fixed itself. And uh, whereas the Keynesians believe you have to get involved, you've got to print the money, you've got to do all these things in order to stimulate the economy to move forward. In essence, this is what I wanted to cover. Um, and uh, remember, there's always a better way.